Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today we will be talking about Suburban Propane LP, which is a master limited partnership that markets and distributes propane, fuel oil, and other refined fuels in the United States. In this video, we will be looking at the company's business by reviewing the company's annual report, then review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios, and finally find the intrinsic value of the company. So let's dive in and review Suburban Propane Partners LP. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that Suburban Propane Partners LP filed with the SEC. This is for the fiscal year that ended September 25th, 2021. And on page four of this report, the company starts off by talking about its business. The company states that it is a nationwide marketer and distributor of diverse array of products meeting the energy needs of its customers. It specializes in the distribution of propane, renewable propane, fuel oil, and refined oil, as well as marketing of natural gas and electricity in deregulated markets and is an investor in low-carbon fuel alternatives. The company claims that as of September 25, 2021, it was serving the energy needs of approximately 1 million residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural customers through approximately 700 locations in 41 states, with operations principally concentrated in the East and West Coast regions of the United States, as well as portions of the Midwest regions of the United States and Alaska. In the next paragraph, the company talks about its MLP structure, that is, Suburban Propane talks about how its master limited partnership is structured, how it has a general partner and other unit holders. So in the future, if we ever decide to purchase a share or a unit of Suburban Propane, then we would become one of those unit holders of this company. Next, on page six of this report, the company provides us a better idea of its business segments. The company states that it has four operating segments and three of which are reportable segments, which are propane, fuel oil and refined oil, and natural gas and electricity. First is propane. Propane is a byproduct of natural gas processing and petroleum refining. It is a clean burning energy source recognized for its transportability and ease of use relative to alternative forms of standalone energy sources. Propane falls into three broad categories, residential and commercial applications, industrial applications, and agricultural use. Residential and commercial markets primarily use propane for space heating, water heating, clothes drying, and cooking. Industrial folks use it for motor fuel. And agricultural markets use propane for tobacco curing, crop drying, poultry brooding, and weed control. Lastly, propane is non-toxic, clean burning, and when consumed, produces virtually no particulate matter or sulfur dioxide. Next, the company talks about its propane product distribution and marketing. The company distributes propane through a nationwide retail distribution network consisting of approximately 700 locations in 41 states as of September 25, 2021. The company sells its propane primarily to seven customer markets, which are residential, commercial, industrial, government, agricultural, and other retail users and wholesale. The company points out that approximately 91% of the propane gallons sold by them in fiscal 2021 was to retail customers, 44% of those propane gallons to residential customers, 34% to commercial customers, 9% to industrial customers, 4% to government customers, 4% to agricultural customers, and 3% to other retail users. Next, looking at the supply of where the company procures is propane. The company states that its propane supply is purchased from approximately 40 wholesalers at approximately 160 supply points located throughout the United States and Canada. In the fiscal year 2021, Crestwood and Targa were the two largest suppliers, which provided about 29% and 16% of its total propane purchases, respectively. After that, the company talks about its competition. It points out that according to the U.S. Census Bureau's 2019 American Community Survey, Propane ranks as the third most important source of residential energy in the nation, with about 5% of all households using propane as their primary space heating fuel. However, propane is more expensive than natural gas on an equivalent BTU basis in locations serviced by natural gas. It's important to understand that majority of these propane customers are in remote locations, and it's very capital intensive to install natural gas pipelines in these remote locations. So up to some extent, even though natural gas may be cheaper where available, some customers may not even have the option of natural gas to begin with. On the next page, the company talks about how propane has some relative advantages to other energy sources. For example, in certain geographic regions, propane is generally less expensive to use than electricity for space heating, water heating, clothes drying, and cooking. Finally, the company points out that its propane operations compete with other retail propane distributors. The propane industry is highly fragmented and competition generally occurs on a local basis. Most of its customer service centers compete with five or more marketers or distributors at any point in time. The second reportable segment is the fuel oil and refined fuel segment. For the product distribution and marketing, the company states that it markets and distributes fuel oil, kerosene, diesel fuel, and gasoline to approximately 35,000 residential and commercial customers, primarily in the Northeast region of the United States. 
Approximately 45% of its fuel oil customers receive their fuel under an automatic delivery system. As per the supply, the company obtains fuel and other refined fuel in pipeline, truckload, or truck wagon quantities and have contracts with certain pipeline and terminal operators for the right to temporarily store fuel at 13 terminal facilities that they do not own. The company purchases fuel oil from approximately 20 suppliers at approximately 45 supply points. As per the competition, the fuel oil industry is a mature industry with total demand expecting to remain relatively flat to moderately declining. Additionally, the fuel oil industry is highly fragmented, characterized by a large number of relatively small, independently owned and operated local distributors. The company claims that it is a full-service energy provider and has developed a wide range of sales programs and service offerings. For instance, it provides home heating equipment repair service to its fuel oil customers on a 24-hour-a-day basis. Lastly, the fuel oil business unit also competes for retail customers with supplies of alternative energy sources, principally natural gas, propane, and electricity. So in a way, this second reportable segment of fuel oil and refined fuel segment competes with the company's first reportable segment, which is its propane segment. The third reportable segment is the company's natural gas and electricity segment. Suburban Propane markets natural gas and electricity through its 100% owned subsidiary, Agwis Energy Services, in the deregulated markets of New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, primarily to residential and small commercial customers. The company serves approximately 39,000 natural gas and electricity customers in New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. When it comes to supply, the company points out that its supply of natural gas is arranged through annual supply agreements with major national wholesale suppliers. The company points out that pricing under the annual natural gas supply contracts is based on posted market prices at the time of delivery, and some contracts include a pricing formula that typically is based on prevailing market prices. When it comes to electricity, majority of the company's electricity requirements are purchased through the New York Independent System Operator and PGM Interconnection. Electricity pricing under the New York Independent System Operator and PGM Interconnection agreements are based on local market indices at the time of delivery. When it comes to competition, it is primarily with local utility companies as well as other marketers of natural gas and electricity providing similar alternatives to AES. Finally, the company has an all-other segment where it sells, installs, and services various types of whole house heating products, air cleaners, humidifiers, and space heaters to the customers of its propane, fuel oil, natural gas, and electricity business. Next, the company talks about the seasonality of its business. The company claims that the retail propane and fuel oil distribution businesses as well as natural gas marketing businesses are seasonal because the primary use of these fuels is for heating residential and commercial buildings. Historically, approximately two-thirds of its retail propane volume is sold during the six-month peak heating season from October through March. The fuel oil business tends to experience greater seasonality. Consequently, sales and operating profits are concentrated in its first and second fiscal quarter. Cash flow from operations, therefore, are greatest during the second and third fiscal quarter when customers pay for products purchased during the winter heating season. And the company expects lower operating profits and either net losses or lower net income during the periods from April through September. In this report, the company points out that majority of its customers sign up for a billing schedule where the billing costs are averaged out over the 12 months rather than having the costs focused in the winter months. And that is what the company is saying here, where even though they may see a lower operating profit and losses from April through September when it's hot outside, it is still going to be cash flow positive because the companies or the customers are still going to pay the company money for the heating costs that they incur during the winter months. Finally, the company's revenue is also weather dependent up to some extent, as it points out that sustained warmer than normal temperatures will tend to result in reduced propane, fuel oil, and natural gas consumption, while sustained cooler than normal temperatures will tend to result in greater consumption. Finally, let's go to page 126 of this report, where the company points out the revenue breakdown across its four operating segments. For the fiscal year that ended September 25, 2021, the company's total revenue amounted to about $1.3 billion out of which the propane segment brought in about $1.1 billion, the fuel oil and refined oil segment brought in about $67 million, natural gas and electricity brought in about $30 million, and all others brought in about $51 million. When we look at the trend over the past three years, we can see that the propane segment saw a slight drop in its revenue in the year 2020. The fuel oil and refined oil segment has been declining over the past three years, which is what the company pointed out, that it is a mature industry that is slowly declining. The natural gas and electricity segment has declined in the year 2020 and has not recovered since. This is because of the emergency laws that were put in place, which would not allow the company to market and reach out to customers to sign them up for their services. And the all other segment revenue has recovered since the pandemic. 
Finally, looking at the segment's operating income. The operating income is what we get when we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. For the propane segment, once it paid for its cost of goods and operating expenses for the year 2021, it had $330 million. The fuel, oil, and refined oil segment had about $7.7 .7 million. Natural gas and electricity had about $7.4 million. And all others incurred a loss of about $20 million. The corporate segment had a loss of about $112 million, which made the total operating income to about $213 million. Finally, let's look at the assets across these operating segments. Propane's assets amount to about $1.9 billion. Fuel, oil, and refined fuel segment amount to about $47 million. Natural gas and electricity assets amount to about $11 million. All others amount to about $18 million. Corporate amounts to about $40 million. In total, the company's total assets for the fiscal year 2021 were about $2 billion. Now that we have a brief understanding of the company's business, its reportable segments, and its revenue breakdown, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, I'm on Morningstar looking at Suburban Propane Partners LP. Under key ratios, we have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2012, the company brought in about $1.063 billion. And for the training 12 months, that number was about $1.4 billion. When we look at the past 10 year trend, we can see that the company's revenue got to a high of about $1.9 billion back in 2014. However, ever since 2016, the company's revenue has stayed in the $1 to $1.4 billion range. Next is the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2012, the company's operating income was about $61 million. And for the training 12 months, that number was about $238 million. The company's operating income has a similar trend as the company's revenue. Next is the net income. The net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it pays for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2012, the company's net income was about $2 million. And for the training 12 months, that number was about $154 million. Over the past 10 years, the company's net income has always been positive, which tells us that the company has always reported a profit. Ideally, we want to see the company's net income, operating income, and revenue to have a similar trend. That is, we want these numbers to be positive, staying steady, or increasing. Next is the dividend per share. Back in 2012, the company paid out about $3.41 per share as dividend. And for the training 12 months, that number was about $1.27 per share as dividend. The company has paid out dividends every year over the past 10 years. Next is the shares or units outstanding. Back in 2012, the company had 39 million units outstanding. And for the training 12 months, that number was about 64 million units outstanding. Ideally, we want to see the company's units outstanding number to be staying steady. However, a slight increase in the unit's outstanding number is not uncommon for an MLP. Next is the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. Back in 2012, the company's book value was about $5.92 per share. And for the training 12 months, it was $9.29 per share. Over the past 10 years, the company's book value per share has always been positive, which tells us that the company always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the company's capital spending from its operating cash flow. Back in 2012, the company's free cash flow was about $93 million. And for the training 12 months, that number was about $182 million. Ideally, we want to see the company's free cash flow to be positive, staying steady, or increasing. I will be using the 2021 free cash flow number of $197 million for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now, let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line, so it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2012, the company's net margin was at 0.18%. In 2021, it was 9.53%, and for the training 12 months, it was 10.92%. What this means is every $100 that the company made in the year 2021, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its obligations, and taxes, it had $9.53 left as pure profit. Next is the return on equity. This ratio compares the company's net income to the partner's equity. Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities that have a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2012, the company's return on equity was about 0.26%. And for the training 12 months, that number was about 28.51%. Next is return on invested capital. This number gives an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. 
Back in 2012, the company's return on invested capital was about 2.35%, and for the training 12 months, it was about 11.90%. Suburban Propane's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 9.3%. And since the company's return on invested capital is greater than its weighted average cost of capital, we can safely say that the management is creating value for its unit holders. Next is the interest coverage. The interest coverage gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest using its income in that calendar year. Back in 2012, the company's interest coverage was at 1.05 times, and for the training 12 months, it's at 3.47 times. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had interest coverage of five times or higher. At the same time, it is fairly common to see MLPs having low interest coverage ratios. It is important to note that for every year over the past 10 years, the company's interest coverage was greater than 1.0, indicating that the company always had enough income to support its interest obligations in that calendar year. Next is the financial health and liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0. It's even better if it's greater than 1.5. Back in 2012, the company's current ratio was at 1.33 times, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.11 times. Next is the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0, as that tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2012, the company's quick ratio was at 0.88, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.63. Suburban Propane's quick ratios tell us that the company has to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Next is the financial leverage. The financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its partner's equity. Back in 2012, the company's financial leverage was at 2.64 times, and for the latest quarter, it's at 3.76 times. Ideally, we want to see the company's financial leverage to be staying steady or decreasing. Over the past 10 years, the company's financial leverage got to a high of about 5.65 times back in 2020, and ever since then, the company's financial leverage has been trending downwards. Finally, looking at the debt-to-equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want to see the company's debt-to-equity ratio to be less than 1.0. Back in 2012, the company's debt to equity was at 1.3 times, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.10 times. The company's debt to equity ratio follows a similar trend as the company's financial leverage. That is, it got to a high of about 3.6 back in 2020, and ever since then, the company's debt to equity ratio has been trending downwards. Now, let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. The day sales outstanding gives us an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes that sale to the date actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2012, the company's day sales outstanding was about 26.7 days, and for the year 2021, it was about 18 days. Ideally, we want the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose day sales outstanding number is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the company's management is being aggressive with its accounting as it's trying to recognize its revenue sooner so that it can inflate its income numbers on its income statement. In the case of Suburban Propane, the company's day sales outstanding number have hovered between 18 to 20 day range since 2013. Next is the day's inventory. This number gives an idea of how many days does the company's products sit in its inventory before they're sold. Back in 2012, the company's day's inventory was about 31.3 days, and for the year 2021, it was about 41 days. Ideally, we want the company's day's inventory number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose day's inventory number is growing because that tells us that the company's inventory is just lingering around on the company's balance sheet. We rather see that inventory that is on the balance sheet be pushed onto the company's income statement and be realized as a profit. As we saw earlier with the seasonality of the company's business, the company's sales are also dependent on the weather patterns. So warmer years are going to have a buildup of inventory, which is what we see with the company's day's inventory trends. Finally, looking at the payables period, this number gives an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Ideally, we want the company's payables period to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose payables period is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the company's management is holding on to its cash in order to artificially inflate its cash flow numbers. Back in 2012, the company's payables period was about 18.4 days, and for the year 2021, it was about 26.8 days. The company's payables period has stayed fairly consistent over the past few years. Now let's look at Suburban Propane's current valuation. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. The company's PE is at 7.2. The company has a price to book of 1.9. The company's price to sales is at 0.8. The company has a price to cash flow of 5.0. And it has a dividend yield of 7.5%.
If we compare these current valuations to its five-year average, we can see that apart from the dividend yield, on all the other valuation metrics, the company is currently undervalued as compared to its five-year averages. Additionally, if we compare suburban propane to the S&P 500, and S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States, and we can think about the S&P 500 as our opportunity cost. We can see that on all the valuation metrics, suburban propane is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Now let's look at suburban propane's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Over here, I pasted the company's 2021 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which was $197 million. I expect the company's annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 3%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 3% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I want to get a 10% return annually on this investment. In other words, I want to double my investment in about seven years. I'm using an annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 3.095%. What this means is after the 10-year mark into perpetuity, I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 3.095%. This number is in line with the 30-year U.S. Treasury yield. The company has 64 million units outstanding and has long-term debt of $1,118 million. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $26.65 per share. When we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price, which is about $17.36 per share, we can see that the company's current stock is trading about 35% below the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $1.4 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year mark in perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $2.8 billion. From this number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $26.65. If we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that suburban propane is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $4.36 per share. If we disregard the debt, in other words, if you think that suburban propane is going to grow into perpetuity, so there's no point for the company to worry about paying off its debt, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $44 per share. Finally, let's try to figure out what kind of return can we expect to get on this investment if you were to invest in the security at the current stock price of $17.36 per share. I will run this analysis by changing the company's discount rate. What I get is if I were to invest in the security at the current stock price of $17.36 per share, I can expect to get an annual return of about 11.8% on this investment. Overall, suburban propane seems to have good fundamentals. The company is undervalued not only from a discounted free cash flow DCF analysis standpoint, but also when we compare the company's current valuation to its five-year average, the company is currently undervalued. It is important to note that suburban propane is an MLP, which is a combination of a corporation and a partnership. And all the income, the profits that the company generates every year are passed down to the unit holders. And it is the unit holders that pay the taxes at the individual level. Due to this unique corporate structure and additional tax filings, it is prudent to confer with your financial advisor and account before making investment in this security. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on suburban propane interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.